This morning I'll be talking to you about the Charcot Murray tooth, which these three lovely young gentlemen uh, described in the late 1800s. It's also known as hereditary motor sensory neuropathy, HMSN, uh, and is a spectrum of disorders caused by a mutation in one of several myelin genes, which result in defects in myelin structure, function, and formation. It's the most common inherited peripheral neuropathy with a prevalence of around 40 per 100,000, with males effect affected more frequently, but females affected more severely. People with CMT have a normal life expectancy. However, the earlier the onset of symptoms, the more severe the neurologic findings. Uh, the basis of CMT neuropathy is an abnormal myelin sheath protein. Uh, myelin gene expression may be altered by intragenic mutation, DNA duplications or deletions. There's several types, but the most common is CMT subtype 1A, uh, which is an, usually an order auto-dominant inheritance pattern with the duplication on chromosome 17. And with MCQs in mind, this codes for the peripheral myelin protein 22, or PMP 22. And this accounts for 40% overall of CMT. In terms of classification, it's broken down into types one to seven with the major divisions between types one and two. Type one being the most common, which is a demyelinating disorder of peripheral, deserve, peripheral nerves. It uh, is usually autosomal dominant and caused by mutations in genes that are express, expressed in Schwann cells, which are the myelinating cells of the peripheral nervous system. In CMT1, a characteristic finding is onion bulbs, uh, which are a thickening of peripheral nerves formed by repeated demyelination, remyelination, and a collection of Schwann cells, fibroblasts, and collagen. Uh, CMT1 is also characterized by markedly reduced nerve conduction velocity. This is in contrast to CMT2, which is an axonal degenerative loss, loss and therefore has normal or only mildly reduced nerve conduction velocity. CMT1 presents in the first or early second decade of life. The initial symptoms are awkward or clumsy gait, difficulty keeping up with peers, muscle cramps, trouble with shoe wear, and later on ankle instability from muscle weakness and onto lateral foot pain, metatarsalgia, and eventually deformity. Signs uh, to look for in particular for CMT1, which are generally quite consistent, are weakness of the intrinsic muscles of the feet and hands first, followed by that of peroneus brevis and then tibialis anterior. <coughs> this progresses to atrophy of the entire calf, resulting in characteristic stalk legs, uh, and also pes cavus and claw toes. CMT1 patients also develop a forefoot and then hind foot ferrous deformity. And in terms of sensation, it's a gradual sensory loss, mainly involving proprioception and vibration and they do go on to lose their reflexes. Uh, you can feel the onion bulbs, so these are uh, palpable enlargements, uh, and it is known to be exacerbated during pregnancy. The pathoanatomy of these deformities or signs are generally uh, based around the weaknesses of some muscle groups compared to others. So the plantar flexed first ray is due to the unopposed pull of peroneus longus against a weakened tibialis anterior. This creates a forefoot cavus, and as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, a compensatory hind foot varus, which is the tripod effect. Um, there is also further hind foot varus because of the unopposed pull of tibialis posterior against a weakened peroneus brevis. The combination of the plantar flexed first ray and the hind foot varus leads to external rotation of the tibia and fibula. Uh, the uh, patients also have uh, hammer toes, although they're probably more claw toes, as a result of loss of the function of the intrinsics uh, in comparison to the extrinsic, which results in a hyperextension of the MTP joints and plantar flexion at the interphalangeal joints. 
They also have ankle equinus, which is from the unopposed pull of the gastrocnemius soleus complex uh, against the weakened tibialis anterior. The second most common subtype is CMT2, which has a usual onset in the second or third decade. Clinically has a similar course to CMT1. However, the sensory symptoms predominate over the motor symptoms and they're more likely to get uh, distal ulcerations. They also have distal weakness and atrophy and decreased deep tendon reflexes. Uh, however, they do have a variable foot deformity in comparison to the relatively consistent uh, CMT1 deformity. And the onion bulb type effect isn't seen in CMT2. In terms of evaluation, plain imaging is usually the first step. And these generally demonstrate forefoot AD duction, plantar flexion of the first ray, and increased calcaneal inclination, as you can see in the X-ray at the bottom. Uh, the fibula would generally appear posterior to the tibia because of the external rotation, and the axial, axial views will demonstrate hind foot varus. Occasionally, you can see a double density um, sign from the Taylor dome because of the varus. Uh, next step is generally nerve conduction studies, and these have traditionally been relied upon for classification, which was uh, the Dyke classification from 1970. And he broke it up into uh, nerve conduction studies above and below 38 metres a second. Uh, so slow nerve conduction studies below this mark are characteristic of the demyelinating CMT type 1, and high nerve conduction velocities are characteristic of the axonal loss of CMT2. Conduction velocities around the 38 metres a second mark are found in the intermediate type forms, one of which is CMT type 1X, which is one of a list of numerous subtypes. This is the, the X-linked subtype of CMT1, which accounts for about 10% of all CMT. Genetic testing is very popular nowadays, and everyone with CMT generally ends up being genetically tested. It can simplify the diagnosis and if done as a first step can avoid AMG and invasive muscle biopsy. Because the entire genome is quite expensive to test, they generally uh, focus the testing based on the age of onset, uh, the EMG findings and the inheritance patterns. Usually it's more academic rather than affecting treatment and doesn't affect the treatment outcomes or the form of treatment in known CMT. Maybe an, an option for relatives of those with diagnosed CMT and it is possible to do prenatal testing if you know there's a genetic mutation within a particular family. In terms of management options, it's all supportive. There's no specific disease modifying therapy. So the goals are, with most orthopaedic problems, to preserve function, decrease pain, and protect from further injury. The focus uh, would be one of Mr. Hoare to uh, focus on mobilization and strengthening with non-impact conditioning, progressive resistance, and stretching. Most common, commonly used orthotic device is the molded AFO. It is recommended to use a locked ankle short AFO with a varus correcting t strip. Um, a rocker sole can also be used to improve gait and decrease energy expenditure. And you can also use an orthotic to accommodate the plantar flexed first ray by raising the heel and the lateral forefoot. If these fail and the deformities end up causing symptoms or patients form contractors, contractures, uh, you can consider surgical management. Soft tissue procedures are the first line, but only if the deformity is supple. Um, these are mainly focused around releasing contractures and compensating for the muscular weakness. One option is to transfer peroneus longus to peroneus brevis uh, to decrease that forceful plantar flexion of the first ray and also AD version of the forefoot. Uh, you can also transfer tibialis posterior to the dorsum of the foot, which decreases the varus moment of the hind foot. Uh, plantar fascia releases can be considered to address the cavus and great toe uh, deformity can be addressed with a Jones procedure to fuse the IP joint and transfer EHL to the metatarsal neck uh, 
to um, prevent that uh, hyper dorsiflexion. Uh, a Gerdelston Taylor procedure may be considered for the lesser toes, which is a transfer of the flexor to extensor tendons. Uh, uncommon to only be able only need soft tissue procedures. Most will need osseous procedures as well with the aim of these to achieve a stable plantar grade foot. Almost all patients require a closed wedge dorsiflexion osteotomy of the first metatarsal. And this may be all that is required if the deformity corrects with the Coleman block test. The hind foot varus can be addressed with a Dwyer closing wedge for a lateral displacement osteotomy of the calcaneus. Um, this is also useful because it corrects the foot during the heel strike and lateralizes the uh, force of the Achilles vector during toe-off. Um, triple arthrodesis is the salvage procedure uh, for any patients with severe rigid deformities where the other procedures uh, aren't effective. Despite all of these surgical procedures, most patients still require an orthotic device to address the weakness of tibialis posterior and uh, aid with the management of the uh, foot drop. So even though at the moment there's no directed therapies, there's a few that people are looking into. Uh, one is a progesterone antagonist. We know that progesterone increases PMP2 expression. And we also know that CMT disease is exacerbated during pregnancy, uh, likely due to the increase in progesterone. However, the studies are only at the level of animal models so far, uh, with a progesterone antagonist shown to reduce the overexpression of PMP22 and slowing disease progression. Vitamin C is known to promote myelination, but isn't looking quite as promising, and a small RCT in a paediatric population didn't show any benefit. Uh, neurotrophin 3 is another uh, state, another uh, model in the early stages, uh, which has been shown to improve axonal regeneration in a mouse model and also improve cerebral nerve myelination in a small pilot study of around eight patients. So all of these are in early stages um, and at this stage are not looking that promising to be find a cure. Thank you.